Most of the time, games make you the good guy and you're supposed to do the right thing. There's actually a lot of games that don't, though. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 games that reward you for being nasty and evil. You are not in control. Starting off at number 10, it's the Infamous series. Unlike most games where choosing between good and evil mostly affects how the story plays out, being good or evil in the Infamous games drastically changes what powers and abilities you have access to. In general, good powers are about more accurately taking out enemies, stunning them so you can non-lethally take them out, while evil powers are more about causing mass destruction. Uh, this being a superhero game, guess which powers are better? Yeah, it's the mass destruction ones. In most people's opinion, the games are just better when you play them evil. Like the powers are more fun to use, you don't have to worry about hurting civilians. You can just go nuts and blast everything in sight. Your karma affects which powers you get access to, so being good makes it so you lose access to some of the most powerful abilities in the game. Uh, like, yeah, sure, it makes so your character is a jerk and you get an evil ending. But mechanically, these games are just much more fun when you're evil. At number 9, it's Witcher 3. Uh, in the last mission for the Heart of Stone expansion in Witcher 3, you're given two options. To either help this guy named Olgier go through the legal process of changing his name to something less bad. No, I'm kidding. You are attempting to get him out of a contract, though. An infernal contract, to be exact. He's not exactly the best guy, but compared to the guy he made a deal with, Gauntar Odim, he's like a saint. Nobody really knows exactly what Odim is, but whatever he is, he's clearly evil. I mean, when you talk to him, he just kills a drunk guy for interrupting. That was the last time you interrupted me. So to finish that sentence I started about a year ago, you can either help Olgierd or Odim. The more elaborate option by far is to help banish the evil spirit, but you get a much better reward for helping him out. You get three options for rewards if you assist Odim, but probably the best one is this endless bottle of vodka called the Bottomless Carafe. This item grants you an endless amount of strong alcohol, which is required for some of the best builds in the game. Compared to the swords you get for helping out Olgierd, which are quickly outclassed by the weapons you can find in the Blood and Wine expansion, it just makes sense to help with the bad guy here. It kind of makes you feel sick helping out someone or something as evil as this guy, but the reward is it's worth it. Just to, It's not even a competition between what Olgierd gives you. At number 8, at the end of the Broken Steel expansion of Fallout 3, you're given a few options on how to wrap things up. The Enclave are using a mobile crawler at Adams Air Force Base in an attempt to destroy the Brotherhood of Steel by launching nukes at their stronghold in the ruins of the Pentagon. Your goal is to change the target so the missiles hit the mobile platform instead, but if you really want to be a bastard, you can make it so that the missiles hit the original target. For the entire DLC, you've been working with the Brotherhood of Steel. There's never been an option to work with the Enclave, so if you just want to be randomly evil and betray your allies, you can. Why not destroy their main base? I mean, it's kind of ludicrous, but in terms of rewards, it is absolutely the correct thing to do. You'd think the Brotherhood would reward you handsomely for helping them eliminate the Capital Wasteland Enclave once and for all, but no, you really don't get anything for your hard work. On the other hand, if you blow up the Brotherhood base, then you can head to what remains of the place and find one of the best guns in the game, the Callahan's Magnum, which is an incredibly powerful scoped revolver. Story-wise, it makes basically no sense at all to blow up the Brotherhood, but if all you care about is loot, and let's be clear, there are more than a few ways to play the game where the loot's way more important than the story, uh, then nuking your allies, it's the better option. It was you. You did this, you goddamn murderer. You've killed them all. Kill this traitor. Kill him. You at number seven, when it comes to Souls games, it can be kind of hard to tell if you're doing something good or bad. It's usually ambiguous, and Elden Ring, no different. There is a small quest, however, where it really just seems like you're being a dick. One of the major locations in the game is the Volcano Manor, a place where you can take on missions to assassinate other tarnished. What in heaven's name are you doing here? The Volcano Manor is a pit of recusants who spit at grace and hunt our own kind. I hope you understand the weight of my words. 
The unique thing about this game is that unless you know the secret to the manor, this seems like the only way to gain access to the hidden parts of it and eventually take on the boss. It seems like you have to do this evil stuff to progress the game. Normally, wouldn't be that big of a deal to assassinate people in this game, but most of your targets are characters who, at one point or another, can help you out. Like, they can be used as summons for certain bosses, which can make the fights easier to handle. Yeah, these are guys that can help you out, and you repay them by, you know, killing them. Each assassination target does get you some pretty nice rewards, usually their weapons and armor, which can't be obtained any other way. So doing these missions is worth it, even if it makes you feel like a total jerk. You don't actually have to do them, though, if you don't want. Like, the secret door to the rest of the manor can be revealed at any time, but once you go into the back side of the area, you get locked out of the assassinations, and you miss out on all the rewards. At number six is Skyrim. In most RPGs, doing the right thing is how you get the best rewards. It's that simple. Even in quests where you refuse payment, you usually somehow get a better reward for your trouble. So being good's usually the way to go if you want the best rewards, right? Well, not necessarily in Skyrim. In this game, you want the best stuff, you just frankly, you have to be evil. So many of the Daedric Prince quests revolve around you just being evil. And if you refuse, you usually end up with lesser rewards. I mean, if you want to get one of the best daggers in the game, Mehrun's Razor, uh, you have to kill the guy who started the quest in the first place. Some of the best rewards in the game come from doing the Dark Brotherhood storyline, which can only be started after you murder someone. It's an evil assassin's guild that has one of the best stories in the game, along with some of the most useful rewards. Tons of easy money, uh, great armor set, horse that infinitely regenerates in the pond beside the sanctuary so you never lose it. Like, it's basically an endless stream of benefits. Uh, Skyrim is basically the reverse of most RPGs. Better to be evil than good. And number five is Knights of the Old Republic. You can complain that the Coder series is a little too binary with its good and evil options, but when it comes to rewards for being evil, uh, these games are still some of the best out there. Playing as light side character, you get a lot more support powers where the dark side is all about destruction. Like that's kind of a Star Wars standard there. In general, playing a dark side character that acts as evil as possible is way easier than trying to be good too. Dark side powers like force lightning and choke can make really tough battles a lot easier, but by far the best power in the game is simply titled Kill, and it makes it so you can clear out entire rooms of enemies with a single press of a button. You can get pretty overpowered as a light side Jedi as well, but it requires a lot more work and preparation, while being a Sith just makes you a walking death machine. At number four is Chrono Cross. Not really a game with moral choices, but it sometimes gives you an option on how to proceed. One of the best characters in the game is this guy named Glenn, a character that's clearly meant to be a reference to Frog from the original Chrono Trigger, as he looks similar to Frog's human form and has the same name. Most players want him in the party, not just because he's similar to a beloved character from the previous game, he's also one of the best party members you can get. You really have to be like a real jerk to unlock him though. At one point in the game, the character Kid gets poisoned. Uh, for most players, they're immediately going to go out and try to find a cure because that seems like the obvious answer, because she's an important character. But if you want to unlock Glenn, you have to refuse to help her. And this seems completely counterintuitive, and you lose out on a bunch of potential party members. But if you do it, you can get Glenn. So if you want one of the best characters in the game, all you have to do is choose not to help your poisoned friend who's dying. Like, they survive either way, so it doesn't matter in the end, but it's kind of an evil choice. Like, if it were in real life and, and you did that, you'd look like a real dick. And number three is Fable. This is a pretty simple one. Uh, near the Darkwoods camp, you can find a sinister looking place called the Chapel of Scorm, a temple dedicated to the devil of the world in Fable. Like there's not really a whole lot to do here except for one thing. You can sacrifice your followers for rewards. Like, yeah, any henchman you hire can be sacrificed at the altar here, which kills them and gives you rewards. The best by far is Scorm's bow, which is the best bow in the game. But to get it, you have to sacrifice like a bunch of people at the same time. Like we're talking about like four people and you just sacrifice it to get a single weapon. It's kind of cartoonishly evil, but the bow is definitely worth the trouble. <laughs> like it's really, really powerful. But yeah, you kind of have to be psychotic. These four lives are worth a powerful bow to me. Here you go, Scorm. Sorry everybody laughs at your name, Scorm. Here's some human lives. I guess that'll make up for it. 
And number two is Cave Story. In comparison to the other games on this list, uh, where doing something evil gets you the best rewards, Cave Story, you kind of have to be evil if you want the best ending. Like, the whole game ends better if you're bad. Very counterintuitive. Here's how it works. At a certain point, you see someone fall into this deep pit. For most players, you're going to go down there and rescue them. That seems obvious. And it's probably something you'd have to do to progress the game, etc., etc. Like, that's what we as gamers have basically been trained to understand from that type of a situation at this point. But if you do that, you actually get locked out of the best ending. In a totally upside-down twist, what you're actually supposed to do is just leave the guy down in the pit. Be a jerk, be evil, ignore them. Keeping in mind, he does die when you go down there and rescue him, so it's safe to assume that he's going to die alone and afraid there when you ignore him. But forget that. What actually happens is that if you ignore him, he appears later in the game just fine. He even gives you a jetpack for doing it. So in every way, choosing not to help someone is the best option here. You get a jetpack and the guy doesn't die. If you help him, he does. And no jetpack. And finally, at number one, Divinity Original Sin 2. A lot of RPGs have some kind of morality system, so you can't just go around doing evil stuff if you're meant to be playing the good guy. What makes Divinity different is that as long as nobody knows about it, you can pretty much get away with whatever you want. That wouldn't be a big deal, but what makes this distinction so important is that Original Sin 2 can be tough. If you try to play as a goody two-shoes and don't steal and never cross anybody or avoid killing everyone, then the game pushes back pretty hard. The game's tough, and the only way to even the playing field is to be bad. When I started this game, I wanted to be this valiant hero, but after dying a hundred times, I was just like, well, guess my goodness and compassion has evaporated. It's gone. So I was stealing everything I could get away with and selling it back to stores to get the best equipment. I was clearing out villages once I'd done all the available quests just to get a little more experience. Like being evil is basically required to survive in the game. As long as you kill all the witnesses, then nobody has to know about it. And you can keep acting like the heroic knight that you're supposed to be in these games. But if you want a fighting chance, you pretty much have to be evil most of the time in Divinity Original Sin 2. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter, Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.